Hi, it's July 21st, 2012. I'm Peter Martinson, and this is your weather report. Now today I want to talk to you a little bit more about global warming, just so the lesson is crystal clear. Now Greenland has a large glacier on its northern coast, the Peterman Glacier. On Monday, a large chunk of the Peterman Glacier calved off into the Arctic Ocean. This one's a little less than half the size of a 100 square mile chunk that calved off back in 2010. According to scientists at the University of Delaware, the Peterman Glacier is now shorter than it's ever been in 150 years, which is how far back our data goes. Some authors, like our current whipping boy, Seth Borenstein of the Associated Press, blame the recent glacier melt on man-made global warming, which means the melting could be stopped if humans stopped emitting so much carbon dioxide. Now, what's the problem with this? Our planet is old. It's really old. Recorded human history goes back perhaps 10,000 years. Recognizable humans stepped onto the Earth maybe two to three million years ago. The Earth itself is well over four and a half billion years old. Our records for this Greenland glacier and for all other direct measurements of climate go back only about 200 years at best. Compared to four billion years, 200 years is equal to approximately zero years. So in order for these panicked alarms of man-made global warming to work, they depend on your willingness to be bowled over by reports of record-setting temperature or record-setting drought or record-setting loss of glaciers. But none of these records are over a few decades old. Take the current American drought. Now, this drought is terrible. We may have lost our corn crop for the year. But we had a much worse drought back in the 1950s. And we had a much worse drought yet in the 1930s during the Great Dust Bowl, but that's not even 100 years ago. We probably had much worse in the deep, deep past. So let's take a look in the past and see what some real records look like. Knowledge of earlier climates on the Earth can be inferred by so-called proxy records. For example, when ocean water cools down, the oxygen in H2O tends to get heavier. When the water gets warmer, the weight of the oxygen goes down. Shellfish use this oxygen in the water in order to construct their calcium carbonate shells. Thus, the fossil record of shellfish can be used to reconstruct the temperature records of the oceans. One such reconstruction of past climate is this one, composed by Jan Weitzer in the year 2000. Using today's average temperature as the zero point, we see that we appear to be coming out of a 60 million year cold spell. In fact, it appears that there is a cycle of cold and hot on our planet about 143 million years long. Weitzer and scientist Nir Shaviv showed that this cycle could correspond with our solar system's passage through the arms of our Milky Way galaxy. In the 200 years of direct temperature measurements that we have on the Earth, our solar system has barely moved anywhere in our galaxy. If you look at this graph of temperature data, you can see that back during the time of the dinosaurs in the late Jurassic, temperatures are much higher than they are now. But 250 million years ago, during the late Permian, temperatures were even higher than that. Therefore, our planet's temperature is probably primarily conditioned by galactic scale forces. Now, let's look at the other main driver of Earth climate, the Sun. Right now, the sun is probably near its solar maximum when its magnetic field is the strongest and it has the largest effect on us. Last weekend, we saw a dramatic example of this. On Thursday, this huge sunspot group unleashed an X1.4 class solar flare, which is one of the largest so far in this cycle. Here it is in the ultraviolet, right there. And here is a close-up of it in the uh, extreme ultraviolet, right there. Now, the solar flare also unleashed a coronal mass ejection, which you can see the forecast track here. Uh, the forecast was a direct hit on the Earth, this little yellow dot. And indeed, on Saturday, we did get hit directly by the coronal mass ejection, and the impact gave us the longest sustained geomagnetic storm so far in this solar cycle. And many people probably saw the aurora coming all the way down into the mid-latitudes of the United States. But as you can see, the sunspot is now rotating away from us, and when it's gone, the sun is going to be pretty much blank. The solar maximum that we're in right now is probably going to be the smallest maximum in over 100 years. 
Some scientists think that this solar cycle will be the last one we see for several decades, and that the sun may go through a prolonged sunspot-free period, a so-called solar grand minimum, much like during the little European Ice Age back in the late 1600s and early 1700s. Again, there are forces that are much larger than our limited 200-year-long set of direct measurements. There's a transformation occurring that we're almost blind to right now. Instead of panicking over global warming, it were better to invest in an extended observation network among and on the other planets so we can see better what we're dealing with. Thank you.